on March 8, 1965, 3,500 United States Marines arrived at Da Nang, marking the first combat deployment of U.S. troops in South Vietnam. It was a day to remember, the day the United States of America entered the Vietnam War. Five months later, the GIs had their first baptism of fire during the famous Operation Starlight. For the following eight years, hundreds of thousands of young Americans were sent to fight the Viet Cong insurgents and the soldiers of the North Vietnamese Army. However, not many know that the first blood was drawn more than a year earlier. It was at the time when Americans in South Vietnam were engaged in advising roles only and were refrained from participating in combat. But among them were some of the finest the U.S. Army had, the Green Berets. These men never turn their backs on the enemy. If you shoot at them, they will surely shoot back. In the early 1960s, as the conflict in Vietnam was intensifying, the United States increased its military involvement in South Vietnam. American advisors established several key positions throughout the country where they trained local groups. One such location was Camp Nam Dong, situated in a strategic valley near both Laos and North Vietnam, a mere 50 miles from the port of Da Nang. Assigned to this crucial camp was Captain Roger Donlin and his Special Forces Detachment, Team A-726 of the 7th Special Forces Group, Airborne. Donlin's team of Green Berets had a unique task, to train and equip local groups, predominantly the Montagnard people native to the highland areas and Vietnamese soldiers from Strike Force 122 of the Army of the Republic of Vietnam. The task was especially challenging due to the fact that cultural differences between these groups were significant, which often led to hatred among them. Apart from its primary role of disrupting the transport along the Ho Chi Minh Trail, the camp also played a vital role in supporting the local population. The team's medics were instrumental in addressing healthcare crises like the encephalitis epidemic. Strategically positioned, Camp Nan Dong was both a shield and a target. It protected approximately 5,000 villagers in the surrounding nine villages from communist threats. However, its remote location near the borders made it vulnerable to Viet Cong attacks. The outer perimeter of the camp was protected by the soldiers of the Arvind Strike Force 122. At the heart of the camp, Donlin's 11-man team, Australian Warren Officer Kevin Conway, and 60 ethnic Chinese Nung mercenaries formed the core defense. Despite formal restrictions on combat roles, the reality on the ground demanded active leadership from Special Forces officers due to the challenges posed by the active VC threat. In early July 1964, in the days leading up to the battle, the situation in the Nam Dong Valley was becoming increasingly tense. Sergeant Michael Disser, leading a patrol, sensed unease in the remote villages. He reported that the villagers were scared but wouldn't tell him or his interpreters why. Meanwhile, Sergeant Terry Tarrant had alarming news. He discovered the bodies of two murdered village chiefs, a grim sign of the growing communist threat. Even the camp itself was not immune to tensions. A quarrel, suspected to be incited by communist agents, erupted between the South Vietnamese strike forces and the Nung mercenaries. Sensing the urgency, Donlin instructed Master Sergeant Gabriel Pop Alamo to prepare the team for a potential Viet Cong attack. In the camp, a sense of foreboding hung in the air. On July 5th, Staff Sergeant Merwin Woody Woods expressed this feeling in a letter to his wife. All hell is going to break loose here before the night is over. As Captain Roger Donlin completed his rounds that night, everything seemed quiet. It was 2.26 a.m. and the camp seemed at peace. Suddenly, a blinding explosion shattered the stillness as a mortar grenade hit the command post. The attack on Camp Nam Dong had begun. The VC assault started with a sudden, violent ferocity. Within minutes, the quiet of this summer night turned into a combat zone. The camp erupted into chaos as mortar rounds and grenades rained down. The Green Beret team and the Nungs were quick to respond, though. They rushed to their position and responded with a flurry of fire, using every available weapon. At the command post, jolted by the blast, Sergeant Keith Daniels managed to send a crucial message to the Da Nang before the building burst into fire, calling for immediate air support. The communication room was destroyed moments after he left it. As the camp's command post was being hit repeatedly, Captain Donlin and Master Sergeant Alamo scrambled to save crucial weapons and ammunition. Unfortunately, Alamo suffered severe burns in the process. Amidst this turmoil, Captain Donlin urged Sergeant Michael Disser to fire elimination rounds from his mortar and provide much needed visibility. As the night lit up, it unveiled the overwhelming number of enemy troops surrounding the camp. The situation was dire, 
The camp was under assault by more than 900 enemy troops. Donlin described the side of the perimeter, lined with enemy soldiers, as the most frightening sight of his life. In the chaos, camp team members displayed extraordinary bravery. Running from pit to pit despite his injuries, Captain Donlin coordinated the camp's defense. He joined Sergeant Woods at a fighting position, then moved to Disser's mortar pit, engaging enemy sappers dangerously close to the camp's ammunition bunkers. With shrapnels in his stomach and arm, Donlin refused medical attention, insisting on continuing the fight. The fighting team within the inner camp, under immense pressure, realized the Viet Cong strategy to detonate the camp's ammunition bunkers and disable their defenses. Disser, along with Lieutenant J. Olenchak and Alamo, fought back relentlessly, firing illumination rounds and grenades to disrupt the enemy's advance. Despite the overwhelming odds, the defenders' commitment to defend the camp and to each other didn't waver at any single moment. Their actions during these critical moments set the tone for the rest of the battle, showcasing their resilience and courage inherent in these soldiers. Colonel Roger Donlin, though wounded, focused on rallying his team and organizing the camp's defenses. In the flickering firelight, he spotted the enemy soldiers had breached the inner perimeter, meaning that the South Vietnamese soldiers of Strike Force 122 had given in to enemy assaults. Nevertheless, the Green Berets and the Nuns, though largely outnumbered, remained resolute to keep fighting, eliminating threats as they emerged. Sergeant First Class Thurman R. Brown and his Nuns operated with lethal efficiency, repelling waves of Viet Cong assailants. The intensity of the battle was unparalleled, with both sides exchanging heavy gunfire and grenades. The Viet Cong, relentless in their assault, had completely overrun Strike Force Company 122 and were now bombarding the defenders with a barrage of grenades. In these harrowing moments, Donlin's leadership was pivotal. He crawled through the battlefield, retrieving weapons from fallen or abandoned positions, ensuring mortars remained active. He encouraged his men to keep fighting, even as the situation became grave. As he moved from pit to pit, Donlin was thrown down by explosions multiple times, each instance leaving him more wounded but undeterred. Amidst this carnage, as he tried to move the wounded Master Sergeant Gabriel Ralph Alamo, a mortar shell exploded right beside him. It was a stroke of sheer luck that he survived the explosion, even though he was severely wounded with blood pouring down his face. Sadly, Master Sergeant Alamo was not that lucky. As the battle raged, the camp became a sense of devastation. Wounded soldiers, including Olenchak and Donlin, fought on, refusing to yield. Each explosion, each burst of gunfire was a testament to their determination to hold the line. One and a half hours passed, and the situation at Camp Nam Dong remained dire with enemy forces pressing their advantage. Even though the call for air support was sent seconds after the battle started, it was still nowhere in sight. Yet the defenders, led by Donlin, persisted in their resistance, fighting with every ounce of their strength and skill. However, it was a question of how long they could keep on like this against the wave of enemy attacks. Then, at 4.04 a.m. came the sound that every defender in the camp had been waiting for, the distant hum of an airplane engine. The flare ship roared over the heads of the beleaguered defenders, illuminating the night sky and reigniting hope among them. As the light from the flare ship filled the sky, the Viet Cong's gunfire began to diminish. The presence of the flare aircraft signaled the impending airstrike, and the VCs were well aware of that. Sensing the shift in momentum, they started to withdraw. However, the battle was far from over. In an unexpected move, the Viet Cong employed a loudspeaker. In Vietnamese, and then in English, they threatened to annihilate the camp, demanding that the defenders surrender. This attempt to intimidate was met with defiance and anger from the defenders. The VC interpreter relayed the message, but the response from the Americans was resolute. They would not surrender. However, a more lethal threat emerged when enemy troops began operating a 60mm mortar from within the camp itself. Captain Donlin, surveying the battlefield, spotted a group of Viet Congs hiding behind tree stumps approximately 50 yards in front of Staff Sergeant Woods' position. Donlin called out to Woody, asking if it was possible to hit the enemy with an 81mm mortar at such close range. Woody, undeterred by the challenge and the unconventional nature of the task, responded with a resolute willingness to attempt the seemingly impossible shot. Woody adjusted the mortar tube, aiming almost straight up without using sights. The mortar round was fired, and the tree stumps, along with the last of the Viet Cong hiding behind him, were obliterated in a powerful explosion. 
This explosion effectively ended the intense and prolonged fighting at Namdong. As the dust settled, the sporadic echoes of small arms fire faded, signaling the conclusion of a battle that attested the limits of courage and endurance of the defenders of Camp Nang Dong. Having stood resolutely against overwhelming odds, they emerged with a hard-fought victory. As dawn broke over Camp Nam Dong, the aftermath of the night's intense battle became clear. The cost of the defense was high, both in terms of lives lost and sacrifices made. Sixty defenders were killed in the fight. Among them were Master Sergeant Gabriel Ralph Alamo and Sergeant John Houston, who were posthumously awarded the Distinguished Service Cross, the nation's second highest military decoration. Australian Warrant Officer Kevin Conway, another brave soldier, also lost his life in the battle. On the other side, there were 54 enemy dead left behind on the battle site. Undoubtedly, the number of VCs killed was much higher. The survivors of Detachment A-726 were recognized for their bravery and service. At a ceremony at the White House, they were honored as one of the most decorated units in Army history. The team members, including Lieutenant Jay Olenshak, Sergeant First Class Thurman R. Brown, Sergeant Michael Disser, and Sergeant Terry Terran received Silver Stars. Sergeant Vernon Beeson, Staff Sergeant Keith Daniels, Sergeant Thomas L. Gregg, Staff Sergeant Raymond Witt Witzel, and Staff Sergeant Merwin Woody Woods were awarded Bronze Stars with V for Valor. Additionally, nine Purple Hearts were awarded to the team, a solemn reminder of the wounds and sacrifices endured during the battle. Captain Donlan, awarded the Medal of Honor by President Johnson, humbly shared the honor with his team. He expressed a profound sense of shared valor, stating that the medal belonged equally to all members of his team. The battle's aftermath, however, was not just a tale of awards and honors. It was a story of loss, remembrance, and the unbreakable spirit of those who served. The defenders of Camp Nam Dong, through their bravery and sacrifice, had not only defended a strategic position, but had also written a memorable chapter in the history of military courage.